Well, hello, I am Andrew Hipsley. I am the Dean of the Fairmount College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. And thank you for joining us for our third talk of the brand new series, Perspectives, Legacies of Racism. This is where we invite experts to share their expertise, to help us make sense of our world and our nation, and to have frank discussions of topics, even if they make us feel uncomfortable. This is a series where different and even contradictory perspectives are welcome. Our Legacies of Racism series pulls the experts to center stage to help, sift, help us sift through the facts and ask the tough questions about racism in the United States. So I would like to introduce, uh, call upon Jay Price, Chair of the Department of History in the Fairmount College of Liberal Arts and Sciences to introduce today's speaker. Over to you, Jay. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Robert E. Weems. Robert E. Weems Jr. has been the WSU Willard W. Garvey Distinguished Professor of Business History since 2011. Professor Weems has published and spoken widely in the field of African-American business history, his publications in African-American business history include five books and numerous articles and book chapters. Weems served as a historical consultant and appeared in the documentary, Boss, The Black Experience in Business, which premiered on PBS in April, 2019. In June, 2021, Professor Weems was the keynote speaker at a program sponsored by the regional banks of the Federal Reserve entitled Racism and the Economy, a focus on entrepreneurship. More recently, he has been the focus of a number of local oral history projects, including an oral history project of African-American entrepreneurs, which is available at WSU Special Collections. And currently, he is working on a project involving a survey of ethnic entrepreneurs that compares African-American, Asian, and Latinx experiences. His current project uh, that is in the works at the moment is an oral history project of ethnic entrepreneurs for the Stories for All program. And in the spring, he will be teaching a cross-listed course in ethnic entrepreneurship. So with that, I turn the floor over to Dr. Weems. Okay, thank you, Jay, for, for that introduction. And, and thank you, Dean Hipsley, for sponsoring uh, this lecture series. Uh, before I actually get into my, my presentation today, I do want to spend a, a little time sharing with people how I actually entered into this, this line of research. Uh, in fact, my dissertation and, and first book was on the history of an African-American insurance company based in Chicago. And, and in retrospect, my, my research agenda in, in this realm got off to a rather uh, inauspicious start. Uh, I remember when I decided that I was going to work on, on this particular project. And I shared it with my fellow graduate students at University of Wisconsin. I remember one of my colleagues looked at me and said, Robert, you're going to do a, a dissertation on the history of an insurance company? That sounds as exciting as watching grass grow. And you know that, that really didn't give me a lot of encouragement as I was prepared to move forward. And, and, and also, I had a meeting with one of my major mentors at the University of Wisconsin, who right before I left to Chicago to do research, uh, he pretty much pulled me aside and said, uh, Robert, be careful. And he went off into this spiel about how the company and these officials were going to try to influence my analysis of the company's history. Now, as it turned out, and, and quite frankly, you know, getting this type of feedback generated some, some fears in my mind about, is this really what I want to spend the next few years of my life and perhaps my career working on? But as it turned out, those fears were really, you know, unjustified. As I got into the research on this particular company, I found out that it was 
very exciting on, on, on one level. Just to give you a little teaser, uh, the first, well, the president of the company from 1927 to 1956, uh, his side hustle was being a noteworthy professional gambler in Chicago. And literally he used gambling winnings from poker to help the country make it through, excuse me, make the, the company, excuse me, make it through the Great Depression. And also he used some of his gambling winnings to uh, help resurrect the Chicago American Giants, which was Chicago's entry in the Negro Baseball Leagues, which was in the process of getting ready to fold because of the Great Depression. Now, the other part of this scenario, when I actually met with company officials, they were more than willing and in fact, very open to share information about the company with me. You know, there was no attempt to, you know, influence me that I would write some sort of whitewash history of the company. And that's gonna become more relevant as I get into the presentation, because by the time I began doing this research in the mid 1980s. Uh, it was very clear that the handwriting was on the raw in a negative way for black insurance companies. And this, these officials at that point, they were really interested in having their company's history being documented. Now I wanted to begin my presentation today with this relatively lighthearted uh, material because a lot of the data in my presentation is, is quite sobering, especially when we look at, uh, you know, the birth, the growth, and, and the disappearance of Black insurance companies. So I'm going to get ready to share my screen, and we will begin. Okay, again, the title of my presentation is Jim Crow in the Business World, The Birth, Growth, and Disappearance of Black-Owned Insurance Companies. Now, when most people think about Jim Crow racial segregation, uh, most people generally associate it with the discriminatory treatment of African Americans in the realm of public accommodations, education, and housing. However, Jim Crow was a phenomenon that also manifested itself in the realm of business in the late 19th and early to mid 20th century. And my presentation today will discuss how the birth, growth, and disappearance of Black-owned insurance companies represents a useful case study of how separate and unequal operated in the business world. Now, when we look at the rise of Jim Crow and, and the birth of Black-owned insurance companies, in the period immediately following the Civil War, uh, the Prudential Life Insurance Company and the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company were emerging as industry leaders. And even though these were companies with, with growing prominence in the landscape of American business, early on, both firms offered African-Americans the same insurance coverage, offered their white clients at the same cost. However, within a short period of time, as reflective of occurrences in the larger society, both Prudential and Metropolitan Life developed separate and unequal programs. In March of 1881, a Prudential, citing high Black mortality rates, instituted a policy whereby African Americans paid higher premiums and received less coverage than their white counterparts. And in fact, looking at this particular period in American and, and African American history, we see a situation where the vast majority of African Americans had, uh, who had previously been enslaved uh, entered quote unquote freedom with little more than the clothes on their backs, 
We saw people enter into a still very hostile society. We saw people at the lower end of the economic totem pole. So there were a variety of social of circumstances which contributed to relatively high black mortality rates during this period. And in fact, today, uh, experts in, in the field refer to a notion of the social determinants of health, whereby there are social determinants that influence the health of individuals as well as the health of groups. And perhaps not coincidentally, when we talk about the social determinants of health as of uh, December 1st, 2021, we see African-Americans still experiencing you know, lower life expectancy and you know, suffering from you know, higher rates of a variety of diseases. So again, going back to March of 1881, Prudential cited relatively high black mortality rates as a rationale for changing its policy regarding African-American consumers. Now, other companies, including Metropolitan Life, in fact, followed suit. Now, early on, Prudential tried to portray this policy change as just an impartial business decision. However, a, a later Prudential study would clearly demonstrate the racist motivation for this policy decision. In 1896, uh, Frederick L. Hoffman, who in fact was the statistician for Prudential, published a book entitled Race Traits and Characteristics of the American Negro. Now, Hoffman in his, in his position as statistician for Prudential was one of the leading insurance executives in the country. And in this particular work, while there was a variety of statistical information related to the quote unquote race traits and characteristics of the American Negro, uh, there was some very important uh, qualitative analysis that Hoffman put forward. And part of this uh, qualitative analysis that Hoffman put forward in his work, I wanna share with you now. Quote, when the ever increasing white population has reached a stage where new conquests are necessary, it will not hesitate to make war upon those races who prove themselves useless factors in the progress of mankind. A race may be interesting, gentle, and hospitable, but if it is not a useful race, it is only a matter of time when a downward course must take place. That is a decrease in the population will take place. In the meantime, however, the presence of the colored race is a serious hindrance to the economic progress of the white race. Now, shortly after Hoffman's book appeared, where literally he predicted the future extinction of African Americans, Prudential ceased to do any business with Blacks. Now, Metropolitan Life continued to do business with Blacks, but did so on a discriminatory basis. Now, it was in this setting that Black insurance companies beginning with North Carolina Mutual based in Durham in 1898, emerged to provide non-discriminatory insurance services to Blacks. Excuse me. Now, in looking at the early history of Black insurance companies, uh, Mara S. Stewart's uh, 1940 classic book, An Economic Detour, a History of Insurance in the Lives of American Negroes provides a, a, a panoramic examination of African-American insurance companies and the growth of this sector 
in the early 20th century. And, and in the next slide, I'm gonna go into some of the details of this classic work. But again, in talking about African-American insurance companies and their history, uh, this is one of the go-to works. Jumping forward, excuse me. A uh, little more details on an economic detour. The title related to a broader concept that Stewart discussed in this work that wasn't just relevant in terms of African-American insurance companies, but it was a concept that was relevant to all Black enterprises during the early 20th century. And this was the fact that Black business enterprises were relegated to only serving Black consumers. And when you look at other non-white communities during this period and their entrepreneurs, and just to give you an example, when we look at uh, Chinese and Japanese Americans, while they were discriminated and overtly discriminated against in the early 20th century, their entrepreneurs were in fact able to uh, market their goods and services to the broader marketplace. Again, it was only African-American companies, both insurance companies and other enterprises that were confined to only serving black consumers. And in looking at sort of the evolution of African-American insurance companies, there's a lot of ironies that appear in the narrative. And one of the ironies is the fact that uh, by the early, during the early 20th century, even though white insurers openly discriminated against black policyholders, they in fact attracted more African-American customers than black insurers during the early 20th century. And in a section of an economic detour uh, related to this, uh, Mara S. Stewart uh, offered the following information. At the end of 1938, the weekly premium income of black insurance companies was $248,910. Conversely, blacks paid white insurance companies $995,640 on a weekly basis. And just a little more elaboration in terms of how the insurance industry operated in the early 20th century. Probably the most popular form of insurance that was offered by both black and white firms was something called industrial insurance, which was featured insurance policies that had relatively small face values and were literally insurance agents came to customers' homes and collected insurance premiums on a weekly basis. Now, again, when we look at this question as to, even though white companies were discriminating against black policyholders, they attracted more business and more black customers than black insurers. And obviously there's, there's something very problematic and, and ironic to say the least about this situation. And to perhaps provide some insight as to how this could be a, an economic reality at this moment in time. I wanna share with you a concept that some in the audience may be familiar with. Uh, some in the audience may not be familiar with. And this is this whole notion of uh, the power, if you will, of the white man's ice. Now, this might sound a little strange right now, but it will become clear as I uh, explain. And there are a variety of anecdotes which talk about this notion of the white man's ice and specifically uh, the coldness of the white man's ice. But I'll share with you one of the more popular anecdotes. In the early 20th century, at a time before electric refrigerators were popular, uh, people kept their uh, food cold using wooden ice boxes. 
where in fact, uh, people would go to merchants to get big blocks of ice to keep various food items cold within this wooden uh, ice box. Now in this Southern town, you had a white merchant and you had a black merchant that were both selling ice. And the black merchant noticed that uh, not only were the white customers in town patronizing the white merchant, but the black customers in town were patronizing the white merchant as well. And at one point, the black merchant said, well, let me see what's going on. And he just went up to a, a local African-American and, and asked him, oh, why aren't you buying ice from me? Uh, I sell ice. And reportedly, the merchant received as a reply, yeah, you do sell ice, but the white man's ice is cold. And this is indicative of a larger reality associated with the vestiges of slavery. We know that the notion of white supremacy was not just bred into whites, but also into the enslaved population. And even though by the early 20th century, you know, slavery had been long gone, this whole notion of white supremacy in all areas was something that was still very prevalent. And I think this notion of the white man's ice being colder and this whole notion of black people actually of spending more money with companies that actively discriminated against them is yet another indication of the lingering negative reverber reverberation of the psychological conditioning that Black people underwent during slavery. Now, even though Mara S. Stewart offered a very pessimistic analysis during the early 1940s about the state of Black insurance companies, as the decade progressed, the fortunes of Black insurers uh, dramatically improved. Now, in his unpublished 1962 dissertation uh, examining Black insurance companies during the period of 1930 to 1960, uh, David Abner identified the decade of 1940 to 1950 as being especially profitable for Black insurance companies. And before I get into to, to David Abner, some excerpts from his work, I just have to make a point that every time I look at David Abner's work, especially in the context of uh, the literature related to uh, African-American insurance companies, I never cease to be amazed that this dissertation was never published because there's a lot of very important uh, information in this work that I was not aware of until I actually looked at, again, this unpublished uh, 19 to 1962 dissertation. But again, just to, to mine uh, Abner's work a little more deeply, uh, between 1940 and 1950, and just some, some excerpts, insurance and force grew in the Negro companies at an annual rate three times that of the industry, 13.9 versus 4.4%. Similarly, quote, total income received by the Negro companies during the 1940-1950 decade increased at an average rate three times that of the industry, 13.4 versus 4.4%. And Abner went on. The average annual rate of growth in total admitted assets was more than twice as high in the Negro companies than in the industry during the 1940 to 1950 decade, 15.9 versus 6.7%. And he also pointed out that, quote, during the 1940-1950 decade, policy reserves grew in Negro companies at an average annual rate 
more than twice that of the industry, 14.5 versus 6.1%. So in sum, during the 1940s, black insurance companies outperformed their white counterparts in several key areas. And this appeared directly linked to African-American occupational and wage gains during World War II and afterwards. Now, white insurance companies, perhaps surprised by their black counterparts' strong performance during the 1940s, began to reevaluate the African-American consumer market during the 1950s. Now I mentioned in this presentation, there'd be a lot of ironies. And, th and this next irony I'm gonna talk about is one that I say it was literally dripping with irony. During the 1950s, we saw a situation where the historic discrimination practiced by Prudential, Metropolitan Life, and other white insurance companies against Blacks actually helped them to generate new business in the African-American community. Now, because Blacks had previously been denied equitable insurance coverage with industry giants, it quickly became a status symbol in the African-American community to be able to say that you possess a, a non-discriminatory policy from a mainstream insurance company. Now also besides profiting from previous discrimination, companies such as Prudential and MetLife subsequently increased their market share in the African-American community by recruiting top agents from black insurance companies. And similar to how major league baseball teams secured the best talent from the old Negro leagues, insurance industry giants with promises of financial reward were able to quickly secure a cadre of trained black insurance agents. Now, in this context to revisit uh, David Abner's research, uh, he again gives us some additional verification of how white insurers were able to increase their market share in what was then called the quote unquote Negro market. Between 1945 and 19, excuse me, 1943 and 1957, the number of white companies that insured African Americans nearly doubled from 55 to 104. And this contributed to a significant profitability shift during the 1950s. Now, unlike the 1940s, the average annual growth of mainstream insurance companies, insurance in force during the decade of 1950 to 1960, quote, was almost twice that of the Negro companies, 9.6 versus 5.3%. Likewise, during the 1950s, the broad-based industry figures for total income, quote, average an annual rate more than one and one half times as great as that of the Negro companies, 7.3 versus 4.9%. Consequently, by the 1960s, the economic landscape that Mary S. Stewart had complained about a generation earlier was getting progressively worse for black insurers. Now, for their part, when we get to the 1960s, we see black insurance companies uh, actively responding to increase white competition. I made a reference earlier to my PhD dissertation and, and first book. Uh, this was the title, in fact, of my first book, Black Business in the Black Metropolis, the Chicago Metropolitan Insurance Company, 1925 to 1985. And this particular company, I think, provides a useful example of how Black insurance companies responded to this situation of increased white competition. 
Now, at its January 20th, 1964 annual meeting, uh, Chicago Mets President George S. Harris squarely addressed the issue of employee defections. And the quote from his uh, presidential address, from this moment on, let no one among us look at this company as some sort of stepping stone, a kind of training ground for some other job somewhere else. Look not at your company as a minor league outfit where ambitious people prepare for the major leagues. Remember, we are Negroes, and any insurance company that employs more than 500 people should not be considered minor league in our eyesight. Now, besides appeals to racial pride and unity, uh, Chicago Metropolitan and other black insurers sought to counteract growing competition from industry giants by actively seeking white agents to help make inroads in the mainstream consumer market. And in fact, at uh, Chicago Met's board of directors meeting on November 22nd, 1961, a resolution was passed that stated the following, quote, it would be a future policy of the company to employ competent persons in agency and office administration without regard to race, creed, or color. And in fact, Chicago Metropolitan subsequently interviewed, interviewed several whites four positions in the company's agency department. However, in the end, this attempt at racial integration proved to be fruitless. While some of Chicago Met's black agents eagerly defected to white owned companies, white insurance agents were not similarly attracted to employment with this black firm. Now, when we look at, at the black insurance industry uh, by the 1960s, there were other black insurers besides Chicago Metropolitan that were concerned about expanding their client base. And in fact, the 1963 convention of the National Insurance Association, uh, the NIA, which was uh, formed earlier at the National Negro Insurance Association. And this was the trade association of black owned insurance companies. This annual meeting and convention focused on the issue of attracting white personnel. And in fact, at this particular meeting, the NIA's newly elected president, uh, North Carolina Mutual's William A. Clement, stated that unless black companies were successful in recruiting, selecting, training, and supervising other ethnic groups, quote, we will be limited in penetrating the total market. Now in the end, despite uh, Clement's, you know, exhortations to uh, black insurance companies, we saw these firms being subsequently unable to attract white employees and clients. So in fact, by 1967, uh, National Insurance Association companies were forced to come to the conclusion that their future operations would in fact be dictated by ongoing de facto, if not de jure, uh, racial exclusion. And as we'll see in, in the next couple of slides, uh, by 1967, Black insurance companies uh, in the United States represented the proverbial uh, dead man walking. Now, when we look at African American insurance companies uh, in aggregate from 1962, to 1992, uh, we see a situation where uh, the last decades of the 20th century were extremely difficult 
for black owned insurance companies. Uh, among other things, these companies were trapped in the unenviable position of being unable to expand their client base while simultaneously seeing white competitors secure more and more black policyholders. And one of the consequences of this was that there were an increasing number of black insurance companies that disappeared from the landscape of American business. And in fact, between the years 1962 to 1992, the number of African-American insurance companies dropped from 50 to 23, which represents a 54% decrease. And moreover, those companies that remain saw a significant decline in both their assets and premium income relative to the mainstream insurance industry. And again, just some, some numbers. In 1962, of uh, the total assets of the top 15 black insurance companies in America was $303 million. Of uh, the total assets for the industry at large in 1962, was 133 billion. And the black percentage of industry assets was a very peripheral 0.23%. Fast forwarding to 1992, we look at the assets of the top 15 black insurers. We see a figure of 711 million dollars. Now, the industry at large assets were 1.6 trillion. By 1992, we see the black percentage of industry assets decline to a microscopic 0.05%. Now, we look at premium income and premium income literally represents the lifeblood of insurance companies. In 1962, the premium income of the top 15 black insurance companies was $71 million. 30 years later, that figure had risen to 159 million. And when we look at the percentage increase between 1962 and 1992, we saw the premium income of, of the top 15 black insurers increase by a respectable 124%. However, when we look at similar figures for the industry at large, uh, percentage increase in terms of black owned insurance companies appears fairly inconsequential. In 1962, uh, the premium income of the industry at large was $19 billion. Uh, 30 years later, uh, the premium income of the industry at large was 282 billion and the percentage increase between 1962 and 1992 for the industry at large was 1,385%. And in yet another irony, part of that discrepancy was based upon the increasing amount of money that African-American consumers were spending with white owned insurance companies. Now, in conclusion, in looking at the birth, decline, and disappearance of African-American insurance companies, this represents a, a rather sobering case study of how racism has impacted business activity in the United States. Now, early on, under the dictates 
of Jim Crow, racial segregation, and the economic detour that uh, was discussed by Mara S. Stewart. We saw black insurance companies having their growth unnaturally stymied. Again, as alluded to earlier, African-Americans were the only business community that was literally forced to only do business with consumers in their own racial group. Now again, perhaps ironically, after the vestiges of American apartheid were in fact dismantled in this country, uh, African-American insurance companies quickly discovered that integration in the realm of business was a one-way phenomenon. And specifically, uh, during the mid to late 20th century, and in fact, continuing into this moment, white-owned companies have dramatically increased their market share among African-American consumers. Now, at the same time, uh, many Black-owned companies, and especially Black-owned insurance companies, were unable to expand their client and customer base outside of the African-American community. Now, and fast forwarding to this moment right now, and I'm looking at uh, my computer, uh, 3.41 PM, December 1st, 2001, there are currently two viable Black-owned insurance companies remaining in the United States. And in fact, based upon the trends articulated uh, in this presentation, uh, Black-owned insurance companies may soon be extinct. Now, one of the things that I, I personally feel gratified about in terms of my own research in this particular realm is that clearly market trends are market trends. And clearly the trends since the 1960s are pointing in the direction of black owned insurance companies pretty much disappearing from the landscape of American business. But as a scholar, that has done research in this area. One of the things that I can do, I can't change market trends, but one thing that I can do uh, as a scholar, and one thing that I have done as a scholar is to in fact document the history and the importance of African-American insurance companies and the contributions that they made in a less than hospitable uh, business climate. Uh, that concludes my, my, my formal remarks and I'm open to any questions and comments that, that the audience may have. Okay, well, we have some questions coming in, Robert. So great job and thank you for um, really an astounding presentation. I had not realized how um, devastating uh, this had been to um, uh, black insurance companies. Uh, I've heard you discuss different types of, of um, declines, uh, especially with your work on Anthony, Anthony Overton, but this today, just hearing that the, the loss has been so great um, was very sobering. So thank you for your presentation. And, and Cheryl, as I, as I mentioned in the beginning, you, one of the reasons why I wanted to start off with this relatively lighthearted fare was that again, this information is indeed quite sobering. And, and, and again, I just wanted to have some sort of counterbalance in the beginning to offset a little of, of, of some of the, the data that I shared with the audience. Thank you. Okay, so first question is from Alberto Wilson. He asks, can you discuss insurance companies in relation to black owned banking and finance writ large? Does the entire industry display this declension narrative? That's a great question. And, and I think one of the things that makes the decline of 
uh, African American insurance companies so powerful in the historical context, and especially when we compare them to you know African American banks, is that we know that the African American banking industry was a huge casualty of the Great Depression. In fact, most African American banks uh, pretty much disappeared uh, during the Great Depression and really did not began to reappear until the 1950s. Most African-American insurance companies were a, actually able uh, to survive the Great Depression, but it, it appears that while African-American insurance companies could surprise, survive the Great Depression, they could not survive the one-way uh, racial integration, uh, that economic integration that took place in America in, in the late 20th century. Thank you. And there is a question here from Jay Price. Are there attempts on the part of black owned insurance companies reaching out internationally to other countries such as those in Latin America and the Caribbean or to immigrant groups in the US? Yeah, there was in, in fact an attempt not just by uh, African-American insurance company, but also by other uh, industries as well. Because in fact, in, in one of my other books, I did some examination of a White House conference that was on black business that was sponsored in the early 1960s. And the question came up about, you know, the increased competition that not just black insurance companies face, but other companies face from white entities. And the notion was pushed that uh, it would perhaps be advantageous for you know, African-American companies to expand their operations to the African continent. And there were some interesting foreign policy connotations uh, involved with this because we know during the 1960s, you know, Africa was contested terrain between the United States and the Soviet Union and seeking client states. And in fact, one of the lines from this conference that I, I that sticks in my mind was that somebody said, who could be a better salesman of American democracy in Africa than a black owned company in Africa with some viable goods and services to market on that continent. But yeah, there have been a variety of of this, this sort of discourse, sort of based on the premise that in the end, when we talk about African-American companies competing with white companies here in the United States, that ultimately for a variety of reasons, it would end up being a, a losing battle. Okay, there's a question from Tom Cober. Um, I'm interested in your description of one-way integration. Is this the case in most under other industries? And are there any cases of Black-owned businesses in which whites actively sought to work? If so, do you know what the main difference would be from the insurance industry where this, this did not happen? Well, that's very interesting when we talk about sort of African-American businesses that were able to cross over. I'll give you a, a, a classic example of one. S.B. Fuller was an uh, African-American entrepreneur in the mid 20th century who established a company called uh, Fuller Products. And he pretty much marketed a variety of various consumer items and S.B. Fuller, in fact, to expand his business, uh, sought to, in fact, buy some white owned companies and their product line and market them and, and allow them to sort of keep their, you know, their traditional, you know, trade names. But when word developed, when word came out that some of these brands were actually owned by an African American, that created a white backlash against these products and companies, and S.B. Fuller ultimately ended up going bankrupt. Uh, again, I, as I mentioned earlier, you know, that whole notion 
about the white man's ice being colder. I, I think it is, it's, it's very powerful when we talk about the fortunes or the problems that, that African-American business people have had uh, in the United States and not just black insurance companies, because you have a situation where not just African-Americans were conditioned to think that, you know, the white man's ice is colder, but you have, you know, European Americans who are conditioned to think that, you know, the white man's ice is colder. So you have a lot of very negative propaganda, if you will, out there regarding uh, the capabilities of African American entrepreneurs that over time has really worked to uh, the detriment of, of Black companies. And, and again, just to give you, go back to the example that I mentioned of when Chicago Met sought to expand its operations by hiring white agents. And Chicago Met actually did hire white agents that went into the white community. But when white consumers, you know, said, okay, this is a white agent, but the promotional material for the company that they're promoting has all these black folks in it. Uh, a lot of these white consumers were not that interested in doing business with this company, even though, again, you had a white agent, in fact, uh, being the front person for this country. So for this country, so I think it all goes back to sort of ongoing and lingering notions regarding the capabilities of people of African descent. Because as of this day, there's some people that still believe that black people are, you know, mentally inferior to white people in terms of mental capabilities, in terms of business acumen and the like. So uh, black business people, not just in the insurance industry, but in other sectors, you know, it's been a, a tough role to hold for these individuals. But again, I, I think among other things that speaks to the power of entrepreneurship because entrepreneurs by necessity are risk takers and you see people that have been very willing and African-American entrepreneurs willing to take risk in an environment that they know at times could be a bit inhospitable to them and their hope for profitability. Thanks, Robert. Um, I have a question and then we probably have time for one or two more. And my question is in, in looking at, um, Parallel, well, in looking at Wichita history, have you seen any similar parallels, not necessarily in the um, insurance industry, but black owned businesses as a whole in Wichita, have you seen any type of, of parallel? In, 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 in what sense? What? In, in decline and um, lack of support. Well, uh... When we, and, and, and I'm glad you asked that, that question because one of the issues that I didn't get in, into this in terms of the presentation, but I think it is relevant to help explain one of the reasons why black insurance companies decline. And it deals with basic issues of economy of scale. We know larger companies can in fact offer products much more economically the smaller enterprises. For instance, Walmart can offer products much more economically than the proverbial bond pa corner store. And when we talk about you know, the black insurance industry uh, and black insurance companies, individually, they were quite small as compared to say companies like Prudential and Metropolitan Life. So indeed on one level, Prudential and Metropolitan Life could offer uh, black consumers more economical policies. But there's a flip side to this story is that one of the interesting things and one of the, the powerful things I found out about the insurance industry while doing research was that insurance companies, unlike other companies, part of their business plan is how do we dispose of surpluses? Because in any given moment in time, there are more people alive paying premiums than people are dying that companies have to pay out death benefits for. 
And historically, Black companies have reinvested their surpluses back into the African-American community. And conversely, and, and I've made this point in, in other publications, that in recent years, we've seen large companies like Prudential and MetLife that readily take African-Americans in premium payments, but are less enthusiastic about reinvesting back in Black communities. And I would take that one step further, and I've written about this as well, is that it's not coincidental that as we've seen the decline of African-American insurance companies, we've also seen the decline of the infrastructure of a lot of African-American enclaves across the country. Because historically, these companies, Black companies, have reinvested back in Black communities. And now that these companies are no longer around, you know, that source of, an, of funding for community investment in Black companies uh, and Black communities uh, no longer exists. Thank you. OK, it looks like we have one more question here. Um, Jay Price has got a lot on his mind. This is from Jay. <laughs> Were there parallel insurance industries for other ethnic and racial groups that faced similar stories or were they able to fare better in this environment? To what extent is this, in addition to a discussion of race, a discussion of small business versus corporate? And has there also been a decline of small and modest scale white insurance companies? Yeah, that's a great question. And in fact, when we look at sort of the development of ethnic communities, uh, European ethnic communities in, in the United States. It reveals a lot of interesting parallels with the African-American community. In fact, during the course of my research career, one of the more exciting collections that I've come across is something called the Chicago Foreign Language Press Survey. This was a WPA project done in the 1930s that's housed at uh, the University of Illinois, Chicago, where they did translations of various Chicago uh, ethnic newspapers. And in fact, uh, I had, I've used that, that resource on a number of occasions, and that's given me, you know, access into the mindset of, say, the Croatian business community in Chicago or the Ukrainian. And there was a similar type of impulse in terms of supporting our ethnic community. You know, in fact, there were some very distinct parallels early in the 20th century. However, as the 20th century progressed, and as we saw the decline of these very distinct, uh, you know, European ethnic communities, and as, you know, people, you know, intermarried, you know, uh, Irish intermarried with Italians, and what, what you had this sort of breakdown of this sort of clear ethnic identification, whereas for a variety of factors, you know, the African-American community has remained this very uh, distinct uh, community. And, and, and also in the Chicago Foreign Language Press Survey, it also featured work from uh, Chicago's Mexican community. So again, it featured a wide spectrum, but there was this similar focus, whether it's African-Americans or Mexicans or Serbs, or Croats that, you know, we need to be primarily concerned about ourselves because we cannot trust outsiders to look out for our interests. Okay, one last question, Robert, if, if you're up for it. <laughs> that, that'd be fine. Okay, this is from our friend Tia Owens. What would your recommendations for changes necessary what would your recommendations be for changes necessary for the survival and prosperity of future Black-owned life insurance companies? Well, I, I hate to sound totally pessimistic in this regard, but you know there have been some dramatic changes in the industry itself in the last few decades, because when a lot of these companies were started, in the early 20th century, the capital requirement to start a legal reserve insurance company is much smaller than it is today. 
Uh, today we're talking about you know significant outlays of of, of capital. Uh, yeah, I, again, I'm you know just based upon my own research and perspective, I'm a bit pessimistic in that regard. This isn't to say that there aren't other ways on on a smaller scale that you can form you know financial you know institutions to serve certain needs, but and to me that's one of the tragedies of this from an economic standpoint, in that in a capitalist society. Uh, black insurance companies literally represented the historic cornerstone of African-American economic development in this country. And for African-Americans on one level to sort of voluntarily give that economic legacy up, to me, you know, I just have to say it, you know, represents, you know, a, a, a tragic form of, you know, financial illiteracy. Because again, in this type of society, because one thing too, and I didn't talk about it in the presentation, we're not just talking about the loss of companies. We're also talking about the loss of jobs because when we look at African-American owned insurance companies. We see jobs, everything from president to janitor that were held by African-Americans. There were a lot of professional uh, positions associated with the African-American insurance industry. And, and, and those that has disappeared. So again, I, 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 I hate to offer you know, this fairly pessimistic uh, answer to that question, but again, I, I just have to, to keep it real in, in, in the terms of you know, where we are now and, and, and present day uh, economic conditions. Okay. Well, thank you, Robert. This was a very interesting Although a little sad, well, a lot sad, <laughs> a very interesting presentation. And we thank you for your time spent with us today. Um, and for those of you who had questions, but uh, didn't have the opportunity to ask, uh, I think Dr. Weems is probably open to fielding those questions um, through email. Yes, yes. Okay, and so you can contact Dr. Weems at robert.weems, W-E-E-M-S at wichita.edu. So thank you, Dr. Weems. Um, next, just as a reminder, uh, the, this session of um, Perspectives has one more speaker, and that is Chuck Kober, who is an Associate Professor of Sociology and the Department Chair for Sociology. Uh, our next talk will be on December 8th at 3 p.m. That's next Wednesday. And Chuck will be talking about labor, labor economies and the forces of insurrection. So please join us again and thank you all for spending time with us today.